chapter number 14. And again, it is good to be here. It's always a blessing to be anywhere. And, you know, uh, I know sometimes I kind of get introduced, and I even have it on the card, uh, you know, someone said, well, Brother McGee went in evangelism. I kind of like, I don't really feel like an evangelist. I feel like uh, just a secondhand pastor. Amen. And uh, uh, so that's kind of what it is. I, I, that's kind of what I feel like. I'm not a uh, gifted as far as an evangelist and ripping people's heads off. You know how some evangelists can do. And uh, there is a spiritual gift of profit, uh, what is mentioned in uh, Romans and stuff like that. And uh, uh, my spiritual gift is pastor teacher. But it comes a time when the pastor, you get so many health issues, you kind of got to get out of the way a little bit. And the man that's doing it right now for us, uh, Brother Nate Johnson, he was my assistant for I think about six years, and uh, he's doing a fantastic job. They got old-fashioned day today and uh, grandparents day today. By the way, happy uh, grandparents, amen. How many people are grandparents in here? How many are you, you think your children are a better gift to you than, you know, just grandparents get a gift if you get to see your grandkids, ain't it? I told somebody, you know, just uh, hugging, I uh, had surgery recently, and one of the little girls, she's about two, uh, Ellie's, what, two and a half years old, maybe three, I don't know, but uh, not three yet. But uh, she'd come over, and I'd say, if you just hug Papa, it sure make me feel better, you know, so. And she would uh, hug me and stuff like that, and so I, it makes me feel good. Amen. And we got 17 of them, and uh, I'm very thankful for all of them. They're 12 and under, and some of them have been doing some preaching, and, and they all uh, just seem like really got some uh, good good kids, and so uh, very thankful for that. Amen. And it's not my fault. It's just the Lord uh, looking out for them. But Matthew 14, and we're going to look at verse number 22. Uh the Lord had just done a great miracle, and you, everybody knows the miracle of feeding 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fishes. That was just a little boy's lunch. But he fed 5,000. He said, beside the women and the children is 5,000 men. So if there's women with the men, that would be 10,000. If they got at least one kid, that's 15,000 people that he fed with, with five loaves of bread and two fishes. That's a miracle. And, and amazing, they took up 12 baskets full when they got through. 12 baskets of food left over, and everybody was full, and uh, it was just an amazing event. But uh, look over here, if you would, uh, in, into this chapter. But right after that miracle, we have the story of uh, when, when Peter walked on the water, and that's kind of what we're going to start with, at least today, and uh, we're going to go from there. But look at that, uh, Matthew 14, verse number 22. We'll start there. And um, well, look, look at verse 20. It says, And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up of the twelve fragments, uh, of the fragments that remained, twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men, beside women and children. So they just had one of the biz, best successes that they had ever had in their lives right here. And so uh, it's a tremendous thing. It's a blessing. And God met, did a great miracle. Then we see verse 22. Now, a lot of times after you've had a, something really great happen, it seemed like something happens and, man, you're like, now I'm in a storm, you know? And uh, now things are getting bad, and things are going to get bad for the disciples. And you know who put them in the bad? The Lord put them in that situation. And so I have to look at every event in my life. Uh, I've had eye surgeries, man, both eyes, uh, where they go in, take all the fluid out and the blood out and scar tissue out and put uh, fluid, uh, air in, air pockets in there and then uh, cataracts on both eyes. I had the surgery for that and had shots uh, just in the last three months, probably a shot in both eyes uh, where they put a cancer medicine in there and stuff like that. But uh, you know what? I can see. At least today I can see. You don't ever know about tomorrow. But, but I'm always uh, thankful for that. And I just say this, that everything I've gone through in my life, the Lord has a plan for, you know. Uh, different surgeries and uh, things like that. I've mentioned I just had the, uh, they did a, a fascia thing here in this arm. You can probably see some of the scar tissues right here. And they reroute some of the arteries there and then, they put a tube hanging out of my stomach over here, some of the stuff for a dog. But, you know, I have to learn to say, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. 
For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So no matter where you get put in life, no matter what storm comes your way, you're going to have to realize that it would, uh, it would be the Lord that puts you in that storm. And we see that uh, in uh, this story we're about to read right here. So let's start at verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship. Who put them in the ship? Jesus did, you know. And to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when evening was come, he was there alone. So, uh, by the way, you ought to have an alone place where you pray. The Bible says that when thou prayest, enter in your closet, when you shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So when you find that secret place, the Lord had to send the disciples away, everybody away, until he's all alone. And you know, I found that in my life. God's had to bring me to the point to bring you to that point where you feel like I don't have anybody. And, and you, you probably do. You do. My wife's been faithful to me. We've been married 38 years. And uh, I married her when she was like 12 years old, so she's really young still. I'm, I, I'm old, but uh, she's, I'm kidding. But no, she was, uh, when we got married, she was 22, all right? And I was 25. But, but um, the fact is, is uh, you know, she's been faithful. But sometimes when you're going through storms, you feel like you're alone and nobody understands, and, and, and sometimes you can't. I can't always understand what people are going through. But, um, but he's always there when you're alone, all right? Uh, we'll get to all this in a minute here. Let's keep reading. He was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And Boy, sometimes we're living in a contrary time right now in our nation, aren't we? Man, I, I tell you what, I tell people sometimes, you know, politically you're hearing from this side and you hear from this side and it's like this group hates that group and, and uh, you know, uh, there's always somebody running for president saying, I'm going to bring unity to the nation. It's like, you're not going to bring unity to our nation. You know, you're not going to bring, you know, just because you get voted in doesn't mean everybody, you know, no matter who's president, half the country hates you. Did you know that? The side that didn't vote for you. And so just almost the way it is. It don't matter who gets in. Half's going to be the haters. Uh, half are going to be the people that think they're great. And uh, there ought to be those of us who say, you know what, God is great. God sets up and God takes down. Yes. Anybody who gets to be the president, we go, God put them there. You say, well, they're bad people. Well, uh, maybe we're under judgment. You know, good people. Well, maybe God's blessing us, you know. I don't know, but, uh, and maybe we have a reprieve. I don't know. But anyway, look on, but Jesus put him in that. And it says, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. And straightway Jesus spake unto them. Man, I'm glad that Jesus speaks to us still, don't he? He does. He spake unto them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. You know, one of the greatest things that you and I can do in our life is not to be afraid about everything that happens. Some people live in constant fear. Live in worry. Worry about this. Worry about that. Uh, I read a book one time, and it's called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And, uh, and, and, and the thought is this. You know, I, sometimes, you know, I got 17 grandkids. We all, we've had some running out of the street before, you know, and, man, all, I mean, just unbelievable stuff that happened. It seemed like God protected them. But, you know, you say, what if, if God took one of my grandchildren? I'd hate that. But you know what I'd have to do? I'd have to deal with it. I'd have to deal with it. And so if everything you look at, just say, you know, what if I get cancer? I'll have to deal with it. What if I got diabetes? I'll have to deal with it. What if I got to go get surgery? I got to deal with it. What if I got to go get this? I got to deal with it. And so if you look at everything, just realize this, I will deal with it. God will help me. God will carry me through. It'll help you not to be afraid about everything. 
not worried about everything. Just say, no matter what happens, you know, God will help me through it. Sometimes we go through those hard times. And if you haven't gone through them, you will be. So someone said, if you're not in a storm right now, you will be. And if you, uh, you might be coming out of one or go, about to go into one, or you might be in the middle of one. But storms are going to come, amen? Um, everywhere I've ever lived, there have been some bad storms, it seems like. But they cried out for fear, and straightway Jesus spake unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Verse 28, and Peter answered and said, uh, answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter went, uh, and, 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 and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him. And said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Father God, thank you so much for today, and thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to, to be here and to have this opportunity to speak to these good people. And I pray, Lord, that you'll bless us and that you'll help us in every way, Lord, to do your will and to be blessed of you today and highly favored. And we'll just commit it all into your hands right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. As I said, you're either in a storm, going through a storm, about to come out of a storm. Uh, Job said, yeah, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Uh, Job 5, uh, 7 says, yet man, that is, uh, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. You watch a bonfire and those little you know, embers that fly up. He said, just like that, man's born to trouble. And so, um, you know, our country, we've experienced uh, one of the worst times, of course, was the Civil War. We lost someone said between 610 and 750,000 people in our own country. And that was when you didn't have that big of a population that every family experienced loss. And uh, not to ma uh, mention the economic impact and the destruction that was done and the burning of the South and, and uh, everything that happened. Man, it was, it was a terrible war. A lot of people died. Then we went to World War II, World War I, about 117,000 people died in that war, Americans, just Americans alone. Then we went into World War II and about 417, 450,000 somewhere in there died in World War II. So really we lost more to Civil War than we did in World War I and World War II combined. And uh, even more than with the Civil War and all that. So we lost a lot of people in that war. But you think about it, someone said in Europe between... Uh, the First World War, 1914 to 17, and the Second World War, 1939 or 41 for us, 41 to 45, that 100 million people died in Europe. Just Europe. Russia lost 26 to 28 million of their people. We lost 415,000. They lost 28, up to 28 million people. Unbelievable things that happened. And then the killing of the Jews and the killing of people all over and uh, the destruction and then uh, just all the terrible things that happened. But, you know, I'm just saying this, that we go through those times. We went through the Vietnam time, several years of Vietnam, and a lot of people that died, you feel like we, we, we pulled out and it just got taken over. Korea, well, at least we was able to divide it. And South Korea has been blessed and prospered, but North Korea, I think we lost 50-something thousand in Korea. You don't hear a lot about that. But there's always been that. There's been the bubonic plague and the Black Death and all this stuff. And today it's what the coronavirus, you know. And there's always been something, it seems like. But the fact is, um, I like the old song, we sing it sometimes. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. And what is it? It's going to tell me of an unclouded day. 
the unclouded sky. And there's going to come a time when there's not going to be all this. But for right now, we're stuck down here. And this old weeping way, you know, and, and time of sorrows and the men that's marched off the war and come back with, you know, having to have metal legs and, you know, artificial arms and eyes that are gone, but they came back and they're still active and trying to serve and in some way or another, and we're thankful for that. But the fact is, I want you to understand some things about this that might help you about this story. Number one, listen to this. And that is this, that God's providence places us here. Right where we're at today, that we're right where God wants us to be. You know, whether it's feast or whether it's famine, whether it's great times or it's difficult times, the Lord told them to get into that ship and to go before him and to the other side. The Lord's providence has placed me here. No matter what you're going through in your life, marriage, home, children, finances, health, energy, whatever you might be going through in your life, problem-wise, vehicle-wise, Realize that the providence of God has placed you in this place for a certain reason. It was Jesus in verse 22 that told them, he constrained them to get into that boat. Now think about that. Sometimes we complain. I heard a story about an old uh, a farmer that had been out and worked his farm, worked his farm for years and years, kind of brought up on the farm and and uh, worked it, and same old cows, you know, same old pastures, and 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 uh, the fields, and and the same old gates to go through, and the barns, and uh, everything needed to be done. And he kind of got tired of it. And he was longing for something new, something better. And so he called a real estate agent and asked him to come out and look at it. He said, "I think I'm going to put an ad in the paper and try to sell the farm. I'm going to find me something better." And so he put it back, uh, had a real estate agent come out. They looked it all over and they took a bunch of notes down and wrote down some things and they went and began working on an ad to put in the paper and uh, they called him up and uh, said, hey, let me uh, read you uh, what we have here about your property that we're going to put this in the paper and we think uh, that this right here will work. And so, uh, the, you know, they began to emphasize all the advantages and all the Good points about it. Now, you know, ideal location, beautiful location, modern equipment, sheds and barns and buildings and a healthy stock, real fertile grounds, beautiful well-stocked lakes and rolling meadows. And they kind of went on and finally the old farmer said, stop, stop right there. And uh, the real estate agent said, what? And the farmer said, I've been looking for a place like that all my life. You know, a lot of times we're always looking for something better. And if we've looked at the good things that God's already done for us and the good things that we already have, we wouldn't be so, you know, we start looking at all the negative things that will destroy you. But listen, realize this, that God's providence placed them here. God guided their lives. God placed them there. It was God's will. It was God's plan. It was God's purpose. They were his people. And he put them right in that storm. He put them there. He put them there. All right? That's why, you know, the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. All things work together. For, all things work together for good. Yeah. That's why he said, giving thanks always for all things. You got an old brokey down, dilapidated vehicle that you have to drive. Give thanks for it. Amen. Give thanks for it. And uh, you don't have the, you don't feel like maybe you got the best spouse in the whole world, unhappy with them or something, you know, give thanks for them. You're going to get a lot more giving thanks for them than just griping about them all the time. You know what? Pray about them. Turn that griping into, into prayers for them. Amen. 
Uh, someone said there's two kinds of storm. There's a correcting storm, like Jonah. Went through. Remember Jonah went in the storm, went in the whale's belly three days and, and all that, and he was being disobedient. And so God sent a storm in his life to correct him. And sometimes God has to bring us in a storm to correct us. And you know what we need to do when we get corrected is uh, thank the Lord and receive the correction. Now there's other times, there's another man in the Bible, uh, Job, he went through a storm. Man, remember he lost all ten of his kids in one day? Lost all that? Covered it at Little and Sunday School this morning. But uh, the fact is he went through a storm, but it was a perfecting storm. There's things sometimes happens to us to make us pray to make us get back in church, to make us plead with God. Something that's going to change our life and so he puts us in a storm. Now storms appear sometimes suddenly without warning. Man, they just, man, you ever been in one of those? Had my daughter call me the other day and she says, man, it's storming over here. I thought, you're kidding me. You know, she just lives a, a couple, three, four miles away and uh, she got a storm. We didn't get that like she did. But they appear suddenly, sometimes without warning. And some are extremely severe. Other people don't always get hit with a severe storm. I mean, I've been through several areas, been through Moore, Oklahoma, two different times when uh, after those great tornadoes that came through, one of them was almost a Category 6. They don't have Category 6. But it was 319 mile an hour winds. When it came through more, it just, I mean, it looked like a nuclear, and I mean a mile wide. And uh, in that one city, I mean, it, it totally demolished 1,500 homes. There's 44 people killed. I don't know how it wasn't more than that. And they said nothing could really stand up to that above ground. And it just wiped bricks homes right off their foundation. In other areas, you go down the road, nothing's even touched. And so you don't always know how severe it is and you don't know uh, the aftermath, what's going to happen. Uh, so you don't always know the length of a storm. Sometimes they hear the train, uh, the tornado hits, and then after that it's calm. It's easy to lose direction in a storm. When I lived up north and uh, we traveled some areas and, and I've been through where you get 20 inches of snow in one day and we were coming back from, that was in Iowa, and we had to drive back that day. So we're driving and the highway department said, you get on the highway, anybody get stuck on the highway, just sit because we're not coming for you. You're that dumb. And I was with a group of guys that was that dumb, all right? There was no lady there to give us a reasoning voice, you know. But, but we made it. We didn't have a problem. We saw like 80 wrecks from Fort Dodge, Iowa down to Des Moines, Iowa, just a little bit of area. But, uh, you know, a lot of them, the major highways, they have uh, to get on the interstate, you know, they've got gates. They can shut them off. So they just shut them off. No one gets on or off the interstates because the wind blows and the drifts and all that. But uh, so you can get lose direction in that. I've been one up in Illinois where uh, driving in the snow. I mean, I just stopped right in the middle of the road. It's like I, I can't see the road. I can't see anything. And all I see is snow blowing uh, so thick across that uh, that's what they call whiteout. I mean, you just can't see anything. Just white. And so we did end up in a ditch, but uh, we did get back. But uh, you know, most of the time I'm looking for those little marker signs off the side. You see not a sign, but, you know, where ditches are, they have markers. And then you can sometimes see the reflector and, uh, and, and try to get back that way. But, uh, but uh, and that's why you lose direction really easy in a storm like that. And so you always want to be careful. And so storms go, and they come again. And so... But there's some good things. It removes dirt and filth out of the air. A lot of times after a storm, you go out and it's got a fresh breath, doesn't it? And you go out in fresh air and uh, something good. So that's a blessing. But anyway, uh, they do bring change. Breaks off dead branches. You go out and see all the dead branches and gather them. You got some sticks for firewood, whatever you want to do. Sometimes it, it helps that way. It brings water. It brings green. And so uh, those things are needful. Amen. And so, uh, but so you're going to go through a storm. If you had not already been there, a bad one yet, you're going to go through that. Yes. Yea, thou walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Yep. Yep, I buried my two sisters and preached their funerals and, and uh, many others in our family, all of my parents and grandparents, all of them are, are of course, gone. But, uh, and so, so you're going to experience that if you haven't already. 
one of the hardest things I remember seeing at my mother, mother's funeral was uh, my grandmother was still alive. So her mother was still alive. And my mom died at age 65. And my grandmother was up in her 80s at that time. And she was there. And uh, man, just watching how she cried. I thought she would have a heart attack. She's crying so heavy for her daughter. You know, you hate to see your children have to go before you. And, uh, but to see the impact on her. So it's very difficult. All right, so number one, realize this, that God's providence, wherever you're at right now, God's providence has put you in that place. All right? You might not like it, but I'm just saying that he does put you there. I'm sure Job thought, you know, when he lost the 10 kids and it got all them boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, I'm sure he's thinking, Lord, what did I do, you know? Am I living in sin? It wasn't. But God's providence placed him there. Number two, realize that his prayers protect me here. If you look at verse number 23, it said when he sent the multitude away, that he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And let me say this, that when Jesus ascended back to heaven, you know what he's doing right now? He's not building mansions. Oh, he's up building. A... I don't care about any mansions, you know. I just want to be with him in his house. Amen. In my father's house. So I want to be up in his house. Amen. I want to be right next to my father if I can be as close as I can. And, uh, but what he is doing right now, the Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. You know what he's doing? He's praying for me right now. Even as I'm speaking, right now, Jesus is standing on God's right hand praying for me. Did you know that? That's what the Bible says. He ever lived to make intercession for the saints. Hebrews 7.25. That's what he's doing. He's praying for me. He has a whole life of intercession right now. Oh, you know what the Holy Spirit's doing right now for me? He's praying for me. The Bible says in Romans 8.26 that the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us according to the will of God. That we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself, itself, maketh intercession for us according to the will of God. So right now, when I don't even know how to pray, I'll be trying to pray, and the Holy Spirit said, Father, this is what he means. This is what he needs. I indwell him. I know what he's trying to say. When all I can do is cry, the only time when I can just weep, when all I can do is, is lay my life before him, Knowing that I need thee every hour. I was praying, singing that while ago pray, as a prayer over here. I need thee every hour. Most gracious Lord. I need you, Lord, this hour right now. And as I pray, the Holy Spirit of God's praying. Jesus is up there praying for me. The Father's listening. Wow. So realize this that when they were down in the ship, in the sea, Jesus is up there praying for him on the mountain. He's praying for you. He loves you. He cares about you. He knows what you know. He, he knows what you need. He understands. And so realize this, that his prayers protect me here. No matter what I'm going through, he's praying for me. That's what he's doing. He's praying for you, for me. He cares about us, and he's on top of it. Uh, a few years back, we had traveled uh, up north through, uh, I'm trying to think, South Dakota and, and some of that. We'd been up in uh, Iowa, was cutting back down, come through Colorado, never had been there. We drove up on top of one of those mountains. It was snowing up there. I mean, it's in June. You know, it's really hot down here. And I'm thinking, all them people down there burning up. I said, we're up here in a snowstorm on the mountain. I said, this is crazy. And I've never been up on a mountain that that's high, that that's high up. And uh, experienced that. And I thought, boy, you know, the Lord's up right now praying for us. Everything's good. Everything's cool. You know, everything's wonderful. And uh, while sometimes we feel like, hey, we're, Lord, uh, we, we need your help down here right now. But you know what he's doing? While we're down here, he's praying for us. He said that. Mm -hmm. And thank God for it. Amen. 
All right. So uh, let me get the third thing here. Look over to verse number uh, 25. And that is this. Uh, verse 25, he says, uh, In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking over the sea. Notice where the Bible said Jesus went unto them. And realize this, that when you're in the midst of the storm, when you're in the most difficult times of your life, that the presence of God comes to you there. He come unto them. He knew they were afraid. He knew they were in danger. Not really necessarily because his hand was on them. But they didn't know that. But realize that his presence comes to me here. So no matter what you're going through, you realize this, you know, I've got the presence of God promised to me. He's here. When you've uh, laying in bed, you know, I was in an electric wheelchair for what, uh, about five months, you know, I was in the, that's all I could do. I couldn't, anyway, and then in bed or in, in, that, in that wheelchair, and you're laying in bed and you're crying out to him, you know what, his presence comes to you there. I played over and over a song, um, I Have Returned. Anybody ever heard that song? I have returned to the God of my father, to the Yahweh of Judah. He's Jesus to me, eternal deity. I have returned and, uh, to the God I once knew. I have returned to the God of my mother, to the God of my childhood. That's the way the whole song, it, it, it's about four stanzas, tremendous song. You know, mm, I can think of it now, it's a blessing. You know what, and I just say, I just keep coming back to the Lord no matter what you're going through. I just want the presence of God in my life. So no matter where you're at, you want to make sure the presence of God is there. That is the son of the living God coming to you. That's what he did, he came to them. The one we call Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that will foresee and provide. As he did for Abraham, he saw the, the goat caught in the thicket, the ram caught in the thicket. He's Jehovah Sh uh, Shalom, the Lord our peace. Jehovah Sabaoth, the commander of heaven's armies. El Shaddai, God Almighty, the Almighty All-Sufficient One. And so when you look at it and you realize, you know, his presence comes to me here. I've seen people go through some horrible things and I wonder how to even deal with that. How did they do that? And the older you get, you start thinking more about death. You know, you can't help it. You know, you, you, you see how many of your family died and how many friends have died and others that you thought, well, I thought that person's healthier than I was. And then you watch them lay in the grave and you realize... That death is inevitable, you know. But you realize this, that uh, how do they pass from life to death? And, you know, how much can people endure and stuff like that. But you realize that no matter what you're going through, listen, no matter what you're going through today, his presence will come to you if you're saved. His presence will come to you. He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our shepherd. Jehovah Rahi, the Lord our healer. He's all those things. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Elohim. He's the one who controls everything. He controls it all. And we, we teach it to little children. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hand. He's got the, I saw some precious little babies uh, Today, you know, he's got the little bitty babies in his hand. He's got the and we sing it to kids, and then we get older. It's like I don't know what I'm gonna do. You know, what God's is he not in control? God's in control of it all. You know, we don't need to fear. You know, He controls it all. He consoles. He He comforts us. He's our comforter. That's who He is, Holy Spirit of God, our Paraclete, the one that comes alongside and helps us. He calms. That's what the Lord did for them. He calmed the raging sea. So realize in the storm that, first of all, God places you in that for some reason. 
Don't always know why, but I'll tell you, you pray a lot more in the storm. Or when you bad a bad storm coming by, you ever prayed, Lord, watch over everything. You know, it's it getting scary now. Winds are blowing, all that. And then, but realize that his prayers protect you wherever you're at, especially in the storm. And then his presence comes to me here. And then realize this, that in the midst of that storm, that God's power sustains me here. He sustains me here. What happened? Well, look at verse number uh, 29. 29. And, and the Lord said to Peter here, and he said, Come. And Peter was come down out of the ship. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. I'm just saying it. You know, sometimes you can do some amazing things when you got your eyes on the Lord and you realize that hey, I can do all things through him that strengthens me. The problem is we keep taking our eyes off of him. We've got to set our eyes on him. You know, turn your eyes upon Jesus. You heard that song? Just, you know, look into his marvelous face. Keep my eyes on him no matter what I'm going through down here. No matter the trials. When Paul and Silas were in the dungeon, chained to the wall, had been beaten, their back was bloody and lacerated from the prison guards when they beat them and chained them in the dungeon. And at midnight they prayed and sang praises. Today we'd be, I'm calling my lawyer right now. Maybe you've been with me. Yeah. But they were singing and sing, singing praises to God. Hmm. You know why? Uh, they realize this. It's, it's God's power that sustains me here. He's my creator. Mm-hmm. He's the one that empowers me. He the one, he's the one that enables me. He equips me. He helps me to march through and keep on marching. Or rolling around if you have to roll around in a wheelchair or something like that. And I tell people, and I'll say it to you right now, God's power, that even if you're in a hospital bed, you know, can't get up. Maybe you're quadriplegic and you're laying in the bed. You can't move your arms, can't move your legs. All you can do is lay in that bed. Oh, man. You can have a ministry that can encompass the entire world. Did you know that? Laying in a hospital bed. You never get out of that hospital bed. You know, you're never able to do anything without someone helping you but you can have a prayer life, an intercessory prayer life that can change the world. You can pray for your pastor when he's in the pulpit that he can preach with power and with authority. You can pray for the missionaries, get their list of all their names and you're laying there. And you can just go to God in prayer and beg and plead with God. And God's touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. I'm saying this. You know, a lot of people, well, I don't really can't do anything. Oh, okay. That's just what the devil wants you to believe. Amen. You know, you're not a Bible believer. You're a devil believer. You know? Believing that, you know, I, I, I can't really do anything. I'm of no, no effect. Oh, you can, enter, you can impact a youth group. You can impact the kids at this church praying for them by name. God raised up this one to be a missionary. Lord raised this one up to be a, a, a pastor's wife or a pianist or an organist or a teacher or, or whatever. I wish I had time to preach on that tonight about ladies in the church and women in the church and the great ministry that they can have and do. You'll find Paul many times saying, help those women that labored it with me in the ministry. Yes. That's what he said, Philippians 4, uh, 5, I think it is, or somewhere in there. He said, help those women that in the ministry. Paul talked about Phoebe and these different ones. He said they've been a strengthener, a succor of many, been a help to many people. And... Uh, a lot of great ladies that can have a great influence in the church, I think, if, if we would allow that in, in the proper way. Nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying this, realize that God's power sustains me here. Here's Peter out walking on the water. Now, he had to have enough faith that that would happen. The other side, we don't see them getting out trying anything. You know, I guess, what does that mean? One out of 12 is going to attempt something great for God? 
And I probably see that when I go out and travel and you go to different churches and things. You know, just a few that actually believe that God can do something great and mighty. And, lot, and then others think, well, it's over with, man. All the great revivals are over with and there's no chance. You know, the world we're living in, nobody wants to go to church. Nobody, you, know, you got that, that's the wrong attitude. Nobody's going to go to that. Who was that? Uh, shoe salesman went to Africa that time and uh, two different ones, two different companies, they went over there and, and uh, one of them sent back and said, hey, don't send any shoes because he said, no, they don't wear shoes over here. Nobody has shoes. Nobody wants a pair of shoes. And so the other one went over and saw everybody needed shoes. And he mailed back and said, you send me everything you got. Everybody needs a pair of shoes over here, you know. And so it depends on your outlook. And you're going to get what you put into it and what you actually believe God can do and what God will do. If you're a Sunday school teacher, you ought to believe God's going to fill my class up. If you're a bus worker, if you have buses, you know that God's going to fill my bus up. Man, if we had days, we had great days. Remember one day we had 128 on a 66 passenger bus. We had in Oklahoma City, my wife and I, we, had, we did a Peter Piper pizza day. And so we had all these, man, we packed that bus. It was squatting, man. We came in, and we went to the pizza place, drove up, stopped. We unloaded everybody. We bought, you know, 25 pizzas, and they were pretty cheap at that time. And so we fed them all, had them all, all the kids in the whole, whole place. And I just, I'm like, how am I going to lead in prayer? And I just told, all right, everybody bow your head, and pr- we're going to pray. And everybody in the whole place, even people that were just there eating, you know, they bow their head, everybody prayed. So it was, it was kind of funny, but... Uh, but, you know, but to believe God and to believe in God's power and God's ability. The problem is we don't believe it no more, do we? You know, one of the characteristics of the last days, you talk about last days, perilous time to come, men to be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, inventors of evil thoughts and disobedient and ungrateful and truth breakers and unholy. But then he goes on, he says, and he's talking about this, talking about the church, by the way. Then he says, and, there, and he said, and it said that they're going to deny the power thereof. And I think that's what we do today. We deny God's power. I'm glad Peter thought, you know, I think I could walk on the water if Jesus would let me do it. He asked, and the Lord said, come. But then he took his eyes off the Lord and began to sink. I'm just saying that. Realize that God's power will sustain you here. No matter what you've got to go through in life, no matter what trial you've got to go through in life, realize this, God's power will sustain you. It will. But like I said, I know the Lord's done it for me over and over. And uh, times if you want to feel like you're desperate or you get fear or you get anxiety, and I just found just put your trust in the Lord and go ahead and do what you got to do. Let me, let me give the, the fifth thing here. And that is realize that his promises assure me here. If you go back to verse 22 and 23, he constrained them to get... Well, notice what he said verse 22. It says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get in the ship. Now notice this next part. And to go before him unto the other side. He basically told Mitch, he said, I'm going to see you on the other side. He gave him that promise. He said, I'm going to see you. Now they're out thinking, we're going to sink. We're going to die out here. Where's our Savior? Well, he's up on a mountain praying. But his presence is going to come to you while you're here. And he's going to calm the sea. And you're going to get to the other side because he promised you would. And so what I'm saying is this, is that we need to realize that God's promises give me assurance here. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake you. That's what he said. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So I'm saying this no matter what you're going through right now, realize he's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. He's always faithful. He's always true. He's always right. God gives me his precious promises. And boy, the Bible's full of them. We need to claim them, don't we? Claim those promises. And I say this, no matter what goes on here in this church, this ship, and that is uh, encourage other people in the the ship. Other people, they're in probably worse shape than you maybe. But be an encouragement to people. You know, don't be a discouragement. Be an encouragement. You got to go to church and listen to people when they talk about their problems and their difficulties. You might can encourage them. Be a comforter. 
be a comforter. And, and, and by the way, forget other ships. A lot of times people get where they're pointing, like, I'm going to jump ship. I'm going to get another ship. No, be right where the Lord wants you to be, no matter what the church may be going through. No matter what hard times you may be going through. Uh, one of the greatest stories I think I've ever heard is the story of a man by the name of Horatio Spafford, a businessman. Many years ago in Chicago, Illinois, he sent his wife and three daughters to Europe by ship while he remained in the States, uh, intended to join them later. He was trying to do some business, business work. But en route, there was a terrible storm and the shipwreck uh, in which all three of their daughters were drowned. Mrs. Spafford lived. She made it through. She wired back when they just had that little telegraph type thing and they abbreviated everything and she just said it this way to her husband, sent a message to him. All our daughters have been lost. Only I have been saved. And as soon as he could, Horatio Spafford took the next vessel and when they came near the place where the daughters were drowned, where the ship had went down, the skipper pointed to the place where he was and Horatio Spafford sat on top of the deck of the ship and he wrote these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Hmm. So I'm saying this, that no matter what you go through in life, the Lord will give you the power. He's given us his promises. He said, if I go, I'm going to come again. The Lord himself shall descend with the heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be called to meet him in the clouds. And I just say this, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Keep your eyes, look unto, you know, look unto him. Trust in his promises. Have faith in his power. Rest in his prayers and his protection for you. Have assurance in God's providence that God knows what he's doing. And you can have peace in the midst of the storm. Hmm. That's right. We sing the song, Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. One day won't be no more storms. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a home where my friends and family have gone. Oh, they tell me of a land far away where the tree of life in eternal bloom sheds its fragrance through the unclouded day. Mm. Oh, they tell me of a king in his beauty there. And they tell me that mine eyes shall behold where he sits on the throne that is whiter than snow. In that city that is made of gold. Oh, they tell me that he smiles on his children there. And his smile drives their sorrow all away. Oh, they tell me that no tears shall ever come again. In that lovely land of unclouded day. You know, one day we're going to be there. Let me ask you this. Do you know you're saved? And that's just the starting point. A lot of people think that's the end. They pray for their kids to get saved. Once they get saved, it's like, okay, that's good. No, that's just a starting point. You need to grow. Let me ask you about your prayer life. How many hours a day do you spend in prayer or minutes a day at least? 
I thought, man, we ought we to start a thing this next year. You know, we just had the 19th anniversary of 9-11. What if we started for the next year, everybody prayed nine minutes and 11 seconds every day just for our nation. And that's not enough time, I know, but it's, it's a start. Pray for the president. Pray for his wife, Melania, and Barron, and some of the other kids he's got there. Pray for Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. And Schumer and all the different groups. You know, God let God change their hearts. Maybe pray for their salvation. Some of them I know are, aren't saved. Just some of the things they've said. Pray for all the Supreme Court judges. You ought to have a list of everybody. I got a list with their name and their pictures. But you ought to pray, them, pray for them every day that they would make wise decisions. And, and also, I also say, Lord, cast out the wicked and let the righteous bear rule. So pray for the Supreme, pray for our governor, Asa Hutchinson. Pray for your mayor. I'm not sure who your mayor is. But pray for your mayor, maybe the city council. Pray for your senators, representatives. Yeah, pray for them every day. Pray for our country that it would uh, come back to the Lord. I don't know the country ever, as a country, have been that close to the Lord, but there's been many great revivals, there have been many great meetings, and uh, but you ought to be praying for the country every day. Then you ought to be praying for your family every day. You know, and you realize that it's not just you praying. The Lord's there with you. The Holy Spirit's helping you. The Father's listening. And uh, that even if you're laying in a bed, laying in a wheelchair, laying in a you know, recliner, where you're unable to do, maybe you can't walk, you can't do a lot of things, but you can sure pray. And God can do something. God will carry us above the storms, amen? He'll take care of us. Father God, thank you so much for today and everything you've done. I pray, Lord, that anyone here is not saved, they get saved, and those who are saved, Lord, that they realize that they can have a great, great ministry, that they can accomplish great things for you. And I pray, Lord, you'll speak to hearts. Help us to get right, be right with you because you are our Father and you expect great things of us. And Lord, that we can do all things through you. Lord, whatever it is you call us to do, Lord, you've got that divine purpose. And I pray you'll do it in our hearts and lives today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's